we're here for the uh, food access and affordability for all ses session. Pardon me. So food insecurity is the inability to access food in a consistent manner, resulting in reduced quality and variety of diet. <clears throat> this hunger is often the result of a bigger issue at the state and national level, economic instability. Many families have to make choices on a daily basis, whether to pay for rent, pay for utilities, pay for medical bills, or to buy groceries. According to the 2018 Hunger in America report, or excuse me, Hunger in Montana report, which comes out every two years, food insecurity for Montana households in 2017 was at 11.4%, and very low food security was just below 4%. Now when we compare that to the national level, the prevalence of food insecurity in 2017 was at 11.8% and very low food security was at 4.4%. So we're pretty comparable to the national. So other barriers with access to food may be transportation or living within a food desert. Because Montana is a rural state, a food desert is defined as having no access to fresh fruits or vegetables within a 10 mile radius. Now, we all live in Montana, may, hopefully. Um, so we can picture Montana. It's a very, very large state. It's very beautiful. But within that beauty comes a lot of uh, areas between uh, towns. And so the Indian reservations definitely fall within those um, sparsely populated areas. And so for many of these secluded towns, there are small markets that offer limited access to, uh, sorry, I didn't realize you were going good. <laughs> <laughs> limited access to uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, they're often expensive because it takes a while or it's a long area to travel. Um, or they have access to packaged foods from gas stations or they also maybe have a bar where they can have some fried foods available. Now from a nutrition standpoint, we all know that fruits and vegetables are high in fiber, they provide us with vitamin and minerals that are paramount for health. Uh, so if someone has limited access to these fruits and vegetables, that means that they may choose the budget friendly packaged foods or canned foods. So these foods are high in calories but they're very limited in uh, vitamins and minerals. Unfortunately, following this way of eating may catch up with a person, uh, resulting in high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, or weight-related concerns. For school-age kids, this could result in poor attention or decrease, decrease performance in school. Fortunately, for Montana, we have wonderful individuals and organizations that really want to focus on and care for community food security. Their approach to hunger is through local food production, transformation, distribution, and access to nutritious foods. From, from this food system, we don't only focus on access to food, but also the education towards preparation and preserving of those foods. So we are pleased to have some representatives from these great organizations with us today because they are doing the legwork and the groundwork for providing access to healthy, nutritious foods um, and a local, on a local basis. So I would like to introduce our lovely panel. So we have <coughs> Aubrey Roth, right here, with Montana Team Nutrition and Farm to School. And then we have Dylan Fishman, with the Towns Harvest Garden, MSU Student Farm. And then we have Katie Burton. She is a dietitian, dietitian with CSKT, Tribal Health Department. And then we have Megan Doyle. She is with the Crow Reservation, Raising Places in Lodge Grass. And then we have Brenna Sellers. She is the Outreach Coordinator for Farm Hands Nourish in Flathead Valley. And then lastly, we have Scott Brandt. He is a food access and sustainability team, the FAST, which we heard about last night, um, in the Blackfoot Nation. So, who would like to start giving us a little, how about you? Give us a little bit of uh, an overview of what you're doing 
um, just locally and how that can kind of move forward in Montana. <laughs> Uh, as it was stated, I was a marketing manager for Towns Harvest Garden uh, for two years, and Towns Harvest Garden, for those who don't know, is Montana State University's um, the university's organic farm. It's a learning farm where students in the SFBS, or Sustainable Foods and Bioenergy Systems program, are required to take a practicum to learn the realities of growing food. Um, so not only are they learning in a classroom, you're getting out for at least one summer and um, learning about uh, what it takes to farm local organic vegetables. Um, and as a part of that organization, we don't compete with a lot of local growers, so we don't sell into supermarkets, we don't sell um, at the local farmer's market, we have our own farm stand, we have our own CSA program and we work with other outlets so that we don't take income away from other farmers in the area. Um, and as a part of that, um, we have to be very creative with how we can access our target market because our target market is not um, the average consumer in Bozeman. Um, and to do that, we reach the people who would otherwise not have access to the food that um, the growers here in Bozeman are mostly growing. So people who can't make it to the farmers markets, um, students on campus, um, and to do that we, we have subsidized student shares, CSA shares, so for a much lower cost and probably the cheapest CSA in the Valley, if you're a student at MSU, you can purchase one of these shares and you get fresh local vegetables every single week um, of the summer for a certain amount of time. We also go into some of the Section 8 housing in Bozeman, where there are seniors who are living on um, stipends who don't have access to be able to go to the farmer's market, might not be able to make it to a grocery store on a regular basis, and we set up in that housing complex um, a normal farmer's market with reduced prices. Um, and we allow them also to use their senior farmer's market uh, coupons there as well. We also uh, promote WIC except WIC at our farm stands that are here on campus um, and senior farmers market coupons at that farm stand as well, though we see lower turnout um, at the farm stand because it's on campus than we do actually going into the housing complexes. And um, the amount of feedback we receive, positive feedback from both students and from seniors and other people who just come to our farm stand because they know it's there and they might be put off by going to a big farmer's market for whatever reason, whether it be um, the social aspect or whether it be the connotation of being at a farmer's market. Um, they know where to go on campus to get local fresh foods and students who are also just passing by the farm stand get interested and they walk up and they ask, what is this? Why are you here? And in some cases, how can I get involved? and how can I get this every week? And then we can pitch, we, you know, we have a student share, it's the cheapest vegetables you can get. All you have to do is ride your bike or drive your car quarter of a mile away and we're there for you. Um, and as a part of that, I feel like we have brought a lot of awareness to food insecurity in, on campus. Um, Friends of Local Foods is a club on campus that helps start Towns Harvest Garden and that was part of their mission and then also springing from that food momentum we have the Bob Pantry on campus too which is a, um, a food pantry, a food bank for students and people who can't leave campus or go too far to receive extra help. And Towns Harvest mission I think is growing really well. Um, there's more student involvement every single year from people who are just interested, people who aren't in the <coughs> SFDS major who want to participate and come learn what that's about um, and then in turn learn about food security um, and then also the farm stand and this Section 8 housing farmers market that we do has all been growing every year. Thank you Dylan. So I work for Farm Hands Nourish up in the Flathead Valley. It's an organization um, that started as 
trying to just get everyone in our community to have easier access to the local produce being grown by our local farmers. It's grown and changed a lot over the years and um, so our current mission is to help build a strong community food system that fosters socially just ways of accessing food. So a lot of that um, means that we are at farmers markets doing a variety of programs. We run the uh, backpack assistance program in the Columbia Falls School District. We piloted the first, well, one of the first food prescription programs in Montana this year, partnered with the North Valley Professional Center. Uh, so we are, we are accepting prescriptions at farmers markets through that program. We have the Blackfeet Nourish Project with Scott, um, and, and I'm sure you'll talk more about okay. that. Um, but, so we do a lot of different food access programs. I came to be a part of Farm Hands through AmeriCorps. I, got, I moved to Montana for AmeriCorps and eventually became a food corps service member. Farm Hands, as an organization, really um, brings um, people together up in the Flathead and so folks that are up there serving in food core are always invited to kind of be a volunteer board member and learn what a small nonprofit in the community is doing. So I was lucky enough to get involved with Farm Hands that way and when I decided to stick around I just kept staying until they gave me a job. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm just introducing yeah, myself, definitely. right? Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, so Farm Hands, um, yeah, we have, we have a big reach. We work as far east as communities in Browning and as far west as communities in Eureka and Troy, um, really centrally located around Whitefish, Columbia Falls, and Kalispell. And um, <coughs> yeah, a lot of our food access programs came out of um, seeing a need where where no one else was really stepping up in the community. We have food banks in all three of our communities, but a lot of the mentality there is that this is the way it's always been done and this is the way we're going to continue doing it. And um, the, the board of farmhands and everyone that is involved very much felt like that was not the way that we needed to continue moving forward. So keeping our mission of um, connecting people to our local producers, our local farmers, we started all of these programs to create that access for anyone regardless of income. And I think that's why I'm here today. Beautiful. Thank Thanks. you. And Aubrey? Well, hello everyone. I'm just so excited to be on this panel with these incredible people. Um, I'm having a hard time thinking what are my points that I wanted to say because I'm like, What's, what are they going to say? <laughs> it's great. So thanks for being here. Um, I'm the Montana Farm to School Coordinator with Montana Team Nutrition Program. We're housed here at Montana State University. There's more Montanas than what I have to say, so, you know, buckle in. Um, we are, we get most of our funding through the Montana Office of Public Instruction, um, so we work really closely with them to be able to implement our programs, including the collaborative work that is Montana Farm to School. Um, so my job is to really help schools throughout the state be able to implement Farm to School. For those of you unfamiliar with what that term is or what it looks like in our state, it involves the connecting children to the source of their food through the three core elements, as National Farm to School Network defines it. Those core elements are first procurement, so buying or serving local foods in school meals or snacks. The um, education piece, so nutrition, ag, and food-based education, um, which can look very different from field trips, hands-on, uh, you know, making recipes, exploring food, etc. cetera. Um, and then that um, school gardens or what I like to say, growing and raising food, um, because it's not just about gardens in Montana. In fact, Missoula County Public School District has a school farm, and um, they've been raising livestock there through their Ag Ed and FFA programs for a long time, and just recently they got a state-inspected slaughter and processing facility, which I think is 
one of the most Montana examples <laughs> of farm to school you could come up with. So that's pretty neat that the students will be able to participate full circle and really understand um, what that looks like. Um, so we, the Montana Farm to School is a collaborative um, effort, includes multiple different projects. One is the Montana Farm to School Leadership Team. Um, so it's state agencies and um, <coughs> state nonprofits um, that are coming together to increase collaboration and communication around farm to school throughout our state. Um, we also have the Montana Harvest of the Month program, which is beyond schools. Um, but it features a different Montana grown or raised food each month. Um, so that's an excellent program. And I also have some materials too if you are interested in different resources after. Um, we just had Montana crunch time this Thursday. Who crunched into a locally or regionally grown apple? I had two crunches. <laughs> wow, okay. So next year, crunch time, people. <laughs> There's a Mountain Plains Regional Crunch Off, um, so if you didn't register your crunch, please do that. There is a trophy, um, and we've been crunching since 2013, so I'm doing that. Um, and uh, n this month is also National Farm to School Month, so there's a lot of different things, but really my job is to provide that guidance um, and resource development to help s schools and communities throughout our state. Okay, As Brenda mentioned, I am uh, part of Nourish the Flathead through the Blackfeet Nourish Project. But what I'm here to talk about is the FAST Blackfeet organization that I work with in Browning. Uh, the, I started going to Browning as part of the Blackfeet Nourish Project, taking food in the Flathead that we uh, got through food banks and through purchase of, uh, from local farmers to the uh, food bank at the time and ultimately uh, to the backpack program and the uh, Medicine Bear Shelter which serves lunch five days a week to the homeless and uh, disadvantaged uh, people, mm, that word I'm not supposed to use, but people who don't have access to regular meals. And um, in 2015 I became part of the FAST uh, organization which um, FAST means Food Access Sustainability Team and uh, we saw that there were real gaps in uh, food security on the reservation. Uh, there's 11,000 people and uh, on the reservation they're concentrated in Hart Butte and Browning primarily uh, but there are outlying communities that are heavily impacted with uh, food insecurity. Uh, one of the first things that we did in our realizing that we needed to, um, how to go about what we wanted to accomplish was uh, to conduct a community-wide food assessment uh, plan and survey. And that uh, was done over the year of 2016, 2017, and that resulted in this document here, the Blackfeet Reservation Community Food Security and Food Sovereignty Assessment. And that provided us with uh, a real foundation uh, for moving forward, understanding what uh, the levels of food insecurity were on the reservation. What we found out from that was that, um, I hear you say that 11% in Montana is an average. Yeah. And, uh, we found on the reservation that uh, two-thirds, 67 percent of the people there are experiencing food insecurity. Um, about a third it's chronic insecurity and that, that means uh, you just really don't know where your next meal is coming from. Uh, another third were food insecure part of the time, and, uh, and that kind of means you're not really sure, maybe the weekend's coming up and you don't have much food in the house, so you just don't, just don't really know where, where that food, your next meal is coming from in that regard. Um, towards the, the last couple weeks of the month, it's particularly uh, acute because uh, benefits, paychecks, your resources are, are at a low, and so 
access to emergency food supplies is really important at that time. Uh, in 2018, we had a grant through the First Nations Development Institute to do a feasibility study for what uh, we wanted to develop as uh, using the Livingston <coughs> Food Resource Center as a model to form the Blackfeet Food Resource Center. And if, uh, uh, for, for those of you who might not be familiar with this, uh, Michael McCormick over in Livingston started the Resource Center a few years ago as a result of working with the food bank there. It's a, a wonderful model utilizing a food pantry, a commercial kitchen, and uh, that commercial kitchen is essentially an educational facility and a processing facility for uh, being able to buy local produce and turn it into uh, food that is used in the pantry and is also used as an economic driver within the community. So we are modeling ourselves after that and um, we work with a number of organizations on the, uh, that are working on the reservation, one of which is the Agricultural Resource Management Plan, which uh, Lauren Bergradler and that fellow in the back, sitting back there, Will Seeley, have been working on. This is a, an overarching document and plan, a strategic plan for uh, really integrating uh, production, uh, processing, distribution, and uh, all aspects of the local food system on the uh, Blackfeet Reservation. And it's an extremely uh, uh, ambitious and far-reaching plan. And I think, uh, is it 1.30? Yeah, Lauren is going to speak on the exactly which room it's going to go. 2.35. Okay. Um, the, uh, one of the things that the uh, community food assessment also highlighted was there was a, a, a huge interest in moving towards a food sovereign food system. And uh, some of you may understand food there's food insecurity and there's food sovereignty. Food, food insecurity is not knowing where your food comes from. Food sovereignty is having control over your food system. And as uh, uh, Danielle Antelope last night spoke about, um, at one point, all people in this country were food sovereign. They had control of their food systems. They knew where they, they understood either growing the food or uh, through hunting, uh, through gathering plants. They kept themselves uh, fed and healthy for thousands of years. And um, that is a direction that we would like to go, is to, we've lost a lot of that and we want to move back into that, uh, into that arena. In this year, we, uh, we conducted a strategic plan for Fast Blackfeet, and one of the first elements of that was to establish uh, a food pantry that would be providing uh, necessary food to people who needed it on a weekly basis. And uh, I'm really happy to say that we opened on September 23rd in the Medicine Bear Shelter. Uh, they gave us a portion of their building to open the food pantry. And we've been open nine days now. And uh, let's see, we've served over 1,300 people and have distributed 14,000 pounds of food. Woo! So we're extremely nervous right now <laughs> about the, some of these numbers. Uh, they're, uh, it's exciting. Um, we're out there doing what we've been meeting and talking about for quite some time, and now we have to actually implement it. So our plate is full. We have other programs that uh, are in the works, but this is the, the Oyop Food Pantry, which means in the uh, Blackfoot language is we are eating. We believe that that's a very 
appropriate and apt name for what we're doing, and um, that's what we're doing right now. Our plate's full, and we hope to keep many other plates full for quite some time. Thank you. My name is Megan Doyle, and um, just so you know, I'm kind of not really speaking on my own behalf. I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of a whole team of people that I work with. There's a lot of people um, in Lodgegrass, um, so it is on the Crow Reservation. Um, I, I'm not speaking for all Crow people, I'm not speaking for all Indian people, and I'm hopefully only speaking for my group in Lodgegrass. Um, and the values and things that we've been thinking really hard about. Um, so the projects that we are working on in Lodgegrass, we began um, three years ago with a grant from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, um, and we worked under a name called Raising Places. And so during that time, we did a family-centered design process in our community. Um, and because family was really the core of um, what we, um, as a group, wanted to address. And so, um, you know, we, the people that are on my team, we have roots in Lodgegrass, it's our place, and place that we love and care, care about. So um, we, um, you should also know that Lodgegrass is one of six districts in the Crow Reservation. Each district it has its own uniqueness, and um, it's also the only incorporated district, so Lodgegrass is an incorporated city, so it's under both um, county and tribal um, jurisdiction, which sometimes is helpful and sometimes it's not helpful. Um, but for the most part, it's helpful if we can find the right loophole. Um, so in the process of doing the family-centered design, we talk to everybody in our community, um, even the people who are usually not getting talked to. Um, and by that group, it's primarily people that are really struggling with substance abuse and we're most of the time not surveying those people because mm, they're not convenient, I think. <laughs> um, so um, through that process, we found um, that we really, as a group, wanted to pursue an ecosystems model for our city in rebuilding our city. So he talked, our speaker this morning talked about you know undoing some things. And fortunately for us, in many ways, a lot of what we have has been un undone completely. So we get to start from scratch in a lot of ways. But that's also a huge responsibility because um, it's the desire of the group to really um, build from a, a, a standpoint of values and things that are important um, to people. And, and one of those values that I think is really interesting, my husband is um, a Crow historian, so I get a lot of information about Crow history um, laying in bed at night while I'm trying to go to sleep. But, um, so one of the interesting things about Crow history is that you know Crows were awesome agrarians. Um, and you know they were part of a mound building culture originally. And um, within that culture, as they became more successful agrarians, they started to stratify socially, and um, they recognized that as a value that they did not want to participate in, and so they chose um, to move, and that's how we ended up in Montana. Um, and you associate most Plains Native people with being more um, nomadic and you know hunter gatherers, and, and they chose to make a change in culture because of the stratification that agriculture was creating. Um, so I just think that that's kind of an interesting underpinning when we think about where we are now, because now you know our group is grappling with questions um, about you know how do we want to build what's important to us into the systems that we either build or choose to use, and so we have a lot of systems out there that deal with um, you know food insecurity. We have major food insecurity, a lot like the numbers that Scott talked about. Um, in Lodge Grass, we have one store, which is the only remaining business. Um, it was a little bit more thriving town um, before the coal industry. So in, when the coal industry started, um, the road through Lodge Grass was not wide enough for coal, truck, for coal trucks. And so they built the interstate up, um, way up above the town. So they rerouted most of the traffic. So nobody drives through Lodge Grass anymore. And at that time, there was this huge downturn. In, um, just the economics of the town, which is really common for most of you know eastern Montana, small town eastern Montana, is you know feeling those same things. So we have one grocery store, and that one grocery store is you know relatively expensive because they have to be. They would like to use locally sourced things, like you know we were surrounded by um, uh, ranchers, and, but we can't use that beef that's right there because it can't be USDA processed and put into our. And when we're thinking about that, it seems like an easy solution would be yeah, let's just get a processing center. But it's not an easy solution because that's not how we want to use animals. And that's not how we want to use plants. And so when we think through um, how that works, it makes me choked up because um, you witness people that desperately need to be able to eat. And at the same time, they're still choosing 
a harder way to do it instead of taking an easy way to do it. To me, that's really super powerful. And so what happens in what we're trying to do is that we're building the whole system all at one time because to the people that we're working with, food is, um, food is support for recovery, it's support for bereavement, it's support for parenting, it's support for restorative justice, it's support for trauma mediation. And so um, if we choose to use a food system that is socially and spiritually and nutritionally bankrupt, we don't help ourselves. We have to create a food system that is also socially and spiritually going to feed us because what you see on the reservation is a food system that's nutritionally minimal that is not feeding a whole person because it's not feeding the soul of people. Um, because within there, the beautiful food systems that we have there, which we're trying to rebuild, we've got you know grandparents educating their children while harvest is happening. You know we can't do that if we go to a food bank. Sorry. <laughs> um, and we just have, you know, we have people struggling with substance abuse and, and their memory of being able to take care of their family as children was being able to help in gardens. And it's really important to me that those things come back into our culture. But it feels really, really hard to do. We're building a business incubator. We just got a grant for that. And it has a commercial kitchen in it. We're really excited about that because it's a place for people to do what they were made for, not for people to work in a business that will give them a job because that's what we want poor people to do. Just get a job. Everybody wants to do meaningful work. Um, and that's what we want a place for is for meaningful work. But we recognize that that's connected to whole family healing. We don't want our children leaving our home community. We want their parents to be able to provide for them. We want their parents not to be losing them because of neglect, because they can't feed their kids. Or because they can't provide housing for their kids. And those things are all strangely connected to this food system and this agrarian system. And you know, they're so, it's so all hooked together that you feel like you have to build up the universe all at the same time. So we're trying to build a family healing center. We have um, family um, positive messaging campaigns just to change the things that have been normalized about how we think about how we want to live. Um, and um, so those things are just, you know, when we look at our past systems and our future systems, we do see a past system that, that was healthy. And we do see a past system that we can go back to um, and that we can figure out how to bring forward those values into what we're doing. But we also have a past system that was happy not having surplus, you know? We were happy that way, and um, you know, if we didn't have surplus, we shared with someone who did have a little bit of surplus, it wasn't mass surplus. And I don't think, we don't think that we, we don't feel like we have to have that massive surplus to consider ourselves successful. Um, and so, you know, when we look at that um, idea of having surplus or just having enough to survive, um, it really forces us to be balanced in how we think about how we're going to build these systems. And it is hard to involve people from outside because the drive is so hard, so heavy to, be, um, to um, become profitable. And um, within our own group, we don't need to be profitable if, we can, if everybody can have what they need. Um, and I think that, that that is also a definition of profit. Um, mm -hmm. That's also a definition of wealth. If we can have those things that we need, that is a definition of wealth. It's really important to have. Totally didn't plan on crying through this whole talk, but here I am. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, right now the wealth is concentrated away from where we live, but we also have some of it. We just need to figure out the systems for building it, and I think we're figuring those things out one step at a time. Um, and it's. Um, really tough work um, because we're totally committed 100% to relationship within building the whole thing. And so, number one, that means that we're choosing to love each other no matter what. Um, and secondly, that we're not going to be offended. So it's really easy to get offended in this stuff and because we have, we have values on the line and you have these kind of perspectives on the line. It's, you know, building community is um, relationship work comes first. So that's where we're at. <laughs>
Thank you, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, I, I relate a lot to what Megan is saying, and uh, my name is Katie Burton, um, and I just want to say that I'm so grateful for being here and to hear what Megan just said and the, what the rest of this panel is doing and listening to Dr. Salvador this morning. There's a lot going on in our world that divides us, and food has the power to bring us together. And I get to work with the Salish Kootenai people every day um, up on the Flathead Reservation, and we are a, a medical group. So I kind of come from a little bit different aspect here as a medical professional. Um, I'm a dietitian, but I, I work with a group of nurses and community health representatives and social workers who operated for a couple years under the, T and we still are under the T-HIP program, which is the Tribal Health Improvement Program, which is a wonderful opportunity for us to rethink healthcare. And one of the big things that our nurses and social workers and community health representatives recognized before they hired me is that food mm. is something that is, is truly, there's a different definition to it everywhere you go. And they would be going into homes, because largely we're home visiting operation, and it would just be stockpiled with the packaged commodity foods that have nothing to do with nourishing the families that live in these homes. And the, the commodity program is changing. And there's, there are more traditional foods being added to this program. So it is something that has some potential to grow and actually work with the recipients, the people that are actually supposed to be the ones eating this food so that it can change. Um, but we have so much work to do. And I feel so happy to be somebody working in the traditional medical field to be out in the public um, just kind of gauging what's going on out there and not hiding in the clinic because our people are very very sick and I'm inspired to come to work every day because my native friends are dying 20 years younger than their white counterparts and it makes me really <laughs> emotional too because that's it's just unjust when you look at our history and the way that we forget we forget what happened, and I, I want it to. I want it to be a space where we can acknowledge it, and we can create spaces where we can grow. We can grow seeds that are ancestral, and not just the seeds that um, are are hybrid, <laughs> uh, which is also important too. But a lot of the foods that are donated are not recognized by the people I work with. And so one of the largest challenges I have is, you know, and, and absolutely, Scott, we definitely need to bring the, the food to the people <laughs> as much as possible. Um, but there is, uh, there is a lack of knowledge of what to do with it, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, it, there's an abundancy of food around us. You know, I, I don't think that there's a lack of food. It's what is, what is the food, what is the quality food, is it culturally appropriate? Um, do I, me as an individual eater, recognize this as something that is going to nourish my body? Because when I ask people, just like when Fast, Fast Blackfeet asked Browning, what is your, what are your traditional foods? And of course, bison and berries come up, but also fry bread come up. So that is a, a food that their mother lovingly made for these families, and I respect that. So let's bring all this knowledge to the table and understand what is going to nourish our bodies and just make those as abundant as possible. And as a dietitian, you know, I know all the sciencey stuff, but in my everyday work, I need to create spaces where we can, we can just get together, learn how to cook these foods, help our neighbors have the resources to actually prep them, because many of the families I work with don't have a cutting board or a knife. But that's okay, because we, we do have the abundancy. Let's bring the food into the home. Let's make a meal together. Um, I get to do this all the time. We can use the farmer's market, even though that's kind of a scary place to go to for a lot of folks. But we are lucky to have at least four of them on the flathead. So, you know, let's make these places equitable, approachable, um, 
uh, you know, kind of not seeing the color, as Dr. Salvador is saying, but, you know, just being a human race that is compassionate. And I think more than ever, food has the power to do that. And if we can emphasize to those frontline people, like <coughs> medical providers, like our doctors that see these families every single day, the importance of nourishing food, that will make the difference. And it's all part of it, you know, even, you know, even the people bringing the food to the food pantries, you know, what food is at the food pantry? <laughs> you know, let's work together to, to figure out what that food's gonna be. So, um, so yeah, as the Tribal Health Improvement Program, you know, I think the state of Montana recognized that our healthcare system isn't working, people are very sick, especially on our reservations. Um, there's gotta be a way to have individuals that are highly skilled actually out of the clinic in the community working on social matters that will help bring our children up to speed you know have them have equal access to quality food and quality education quality opportunities you know they shouldn't have to hire a white dietitian you know let's work with the dietetic internship and make sure that there are native peoples that can come into this profession and do the work that i do so, yeah, that's my soapbox, but, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's me. Thank you. So, uh, I was going to ask you guys questions, but I would actually like to just open it up to the audience just so that we can we have enough time. Uh, so, does anybody have a question that they would like to ask the panel as a whole or um, individuals? Yes, sir. I've got several, but I won't. I won't dominate. Well, you might have time. Well, one for Brenda. You mentioned a food prescription. I'm unfamiliar with what a food prescription is. Thank you. I had that question too. Great. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Farmians partnered with North Valley Hospital and North Valley Professional Center, which is a doctor's office in Columbia Falls, to start a food prescription program. So um, we have one practitioner currently and patients that she sees that are ex dealing with ailments like diabetes and obesity and malnutrition and anemia, um, they are getting prescriptions. They look like any other prescription. And um, we accept them at the three farmers markets that we are at. So Farm Hands runs a food access booth in Whitefish, Columbia Falls, and Kalispell. And we do you know, other programs like SNAP and Double SNAP Dollars and Senior Coupons and School Coins, which are um, our, the Senior Coupon Program we do is our own. Um, and now this past summer was the first year where we did a food prescription program. So um, people came, I was, I am the person at all of the farmers markets. So they came to me and they brought their prescription. And the way that we that it worked is that um, we had the funding this summer to give $7 per person in the family every week. So um, we had a family of one, we had families of two and three, and that we had a family of nine. So that family of nine got 60, or was able to get $63 a week to spend on fresh fruits and vegetables at the farmer's market. So um, the first week that they came, I hopefully had a volunteer, and so I left the, my booth and I walked them through the whole market. Um, the markets in our, in our valley up there are three very, very different um, places. The Whitefish Farmer's Market is like crafts and food and, and a lot of things going on. The Columbia Falls Market is a party. It's in the parking lot of a liquor store. Um, <laughs> so there's live music and a party and there's a little area with two farmers and a lot of food trucks. So it's a very different vibe. And then Kalispell is the shopping market. People come there and they shop and they do their business and they go home. And so I introduced them to farmers, to vendors, um, and they came and shopped every single week for fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, the point of me walking around with them that first day is to reduce the 
intimidation of a farmer's market. It is, as Katie was, Katie, right? as Katie was saying, farmers markets can be really intimidating places, especially for folks coming from generational poverty or, or generations of people that don't know um, how to cook fresh produce. And so we also gave out recipes um, seasonally that showed how to use some of the produce that was available during the season. So it started off with things like you know, the cucumbers and tomatoes, we have a hydroponic house, so we had those really early up in um, Kalispell. And now it's things like leeks and winter squash. So we gave out recipes. We've had extra in our budget. So a lot of our recipes used lemon juice and olive oil. So we found extra in our budget to get big, like Costco size lemon juice and olive oil for every family. Um, every single family told me that they'd never had olive oil in their house before. Um, yeah, it was a, uh, for a pilot year, it was an amazing experience. The first couple weeks that families came, um, the discomfort over buying vegetables was very apparent. Um, the concern about not being able to spend the money that they were given because they don't eat that much produce in a week was, was there. Um, and we did surveys every week and the, in it, every single family started off saying that they ate vegetables zero to two times a week. Um, and by the end of the season, almost every family was up to five to seven times a week. And you know, the, the difficult, most difficult part of all of this is that the farmer's market season has ended up there. We don't have a winter market. Um, and so figuring out how to make this program continue outside of our farmer's market season is something we're working on. But um, yeah, I think the food prescription program was one of the, the biggest, the most important programs this summer as far as increasing comfort around fresh produce, affordability around fresh produce, um, yeah. And I just when we this one client, um, I <laughs> I we don't really get to know their name super well. I think um, they kind of come think, feeling that we are you know like a pharmacist you know that more of that relationship. But she in the beginning was really against this. She and her husband are raising their great granddaughter and. Um, no vegetables, maybe canned or frozen vegetables in the house. And so the prescription was actually for the great granddaughter. Um, she wasn't being nourished enough. And this woman, um, she was really tough to work with. I, I wasn't sure that she was going to keep coming. The first couple times she was, she would get upset with me that the food, the money was only for fresh fruits and vegetables. and. By the end, um, because she knew farmer's market season was ending, she not only went to her regular markets in Columbia Falls, but made the trip to Whitefish and made the trip to Kalispell in order to stock up on produce. Um, so we saw some real turnaround in people, and we only had enough um, funding this season to do enough for 30 people, and that is you know everyone in a family. And so we only had seven families over the course of the season, but it was a really, a, a really big turnaround for everyone that I saw. Could I just a quick follow-up? Yeah. So does the does the person have to go to a dietitian like Katie or, or yourself to get like, a different <coughs> prescription and then bring it to you? It, we're, right now we're working with one um, doctor's office and one practitioner in that doctor, doctor's office. She's a nurse practitioner that work and these are her patients. I um, I believe there was, you know, she's seeing folks, sh she was choosing out of her patients that she sees regularly, the folks that are struggling with nutrition-based issues. Do you plan to get more doctors or practitioners on board? That would be fantastic. It's uh, finding funding. Is, has been tricky, is tricky. 
a lot of uh, grants and funders want us to find a way to um, charge insurance companies for this to make it sustainable. But, um, you know, if people are paying, if people are paying an in for their insurance and then we're giving them free money, there's, you know, it's just a, it's a tricky thing. So fi finding funding is a, a huge priority and we've written a few grants and we haven't gotten them and so we're working with <coughs> grant holders and people in the hospital foundation to try and figure it all out. For Brennan to you. Um, is there a way, I'm a farmer and whitefish and I work with Brennan a lot and Scott, um, but is there a way for you to do like the RX and the um, all the coins at like, if I opened up my farm, you know, once a month, because I kind of do anyway, but like, could I take those coins? That's something we should definitely talk about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and something we are working on with the food prescription program. So in our, in those three towns, we, there is a super one grocery store in all three towns. And so we are working on getting that, that grocery store to maybe accept that and have coupons like they already accept for WIC and, and be under the WIC guidelines <coughs> and stuff. But, you know, that produce is not the farm fresh produce that they've been getting all summer. And we all know that there's a difference there, so. Question for me. I guess I'd just a little bit. I'd like to hear more about the raising places project and where it is now and what the earning was that. Yeah, so in two, so 2013, <coughs> I think, is when we got the family centered um, design. Grant. And out of that design process, um, when we worked with our um, community, over nine months we um, refined and refined and refined what they, the feedback that they gave us and to send it back to them and have them look at it again and all that kind of stuff. And then out of that came nine different um, things that we wanted to work on that were part of the, an ecosystem, a healthy ecosystem. And um, so um, from that point, um, we've gotten several different grants, um, some from the state of Montana for developing um, knowledge about business and how to start business and things like that. And then we have gotten some um, from the Montana Healthcare Foundation. Right now we're in the, we just finished the feasibility study for the Family Healing Center. So the Family Healing Center is like a campus project. Um, it's like a village basically in small form. Um, and it is used to meet families before their kids would go into foster care. Um, and then it provides, um, so people want to kind of label it a treatment center. It, if you wanted to label it a treatment center, it wouldn't be for substance abuse, it would be for trauma because substance abuse is a symptom. Um, and so it's more focused on help, helping whole families to bring healing um, to in whatever areas they need it um, so that they can function well as a family, but it puts them in a supported ecosystem. So the ecosystem itself is healthy and then it puts them into that healthy system. So it does involve food, nature, you know, family, community, multi-generations and things like that that are all in, in one space. Um, and then it also involves integrated healthcare, access to healthcare. Um, and um, so right now we're just moving into the development phase. Hopefully we'll be getting a grant to do the development for that. Um, and then um, the positive, me positive messaging campaign has just different phases that we've done at different times. So the, the high school, all the bathroom stalls have happy things in them. Um, you know, so there's kind of some smaller things, but they're all things that were generated by the community. Um, we also have a, like a pay it forward um, home and yard renovation. So there are no homes in lodge grass that, um, you know, when you, when you get an evaluation of the federal sort or whatever, I don't know, I forgot what they're called, but um, there are none that are good or excellent. So everything is fair or poor um, in lodge grass for housing. Uh, but we move one brand new house into lodge grass and so, we did, at the time we didn't have any heavy equipment, so it was the middle of winter and we were shoveling out the foundation for this house <laughs> by hand. <laughs> it took a while, but um, we got a new house in and it has a deck on it now and it's just, we just decided, okay, if we have to do it one lot at a time, we'll do it one lot at a time so we can change how we see ourselves. And then one of the big things that we've done that looks really small when you don't understand what it is, um, 
There, there's a store that was in this in Lodge Grass for a long time that has a lot of memories to it. It's called Cozy Corner, and um, it burned down while I was the one leasing it. Um, <laughs> it wasn't my fault. <laughs> It was kind of, it was a really interesting experience. It was about 20 years ago, actually. Everything, the whole store burned down, and I, I looked through the window, and there was a, everything was burned but the back of this book, and it said, love is a decision, on the back of the book. So anyway, a lesson for me. Um, I did really try to carry that one on. But um, it was a really important place for people to gather socially. It was just a store. You could get hamburgers there, and penny candy is something. Um, but it was a healthy, really healthy um, social and community connection, a really deep one. And so we filled in the hole that was left from that because it was just a dangerous place for kids to play is what it ended up being. And um, we had enough money for one load of fill, which once it was poured in, filled about this much at the corner of the basement. And so miraculously, somehow, nine more loads of <laughs> stuff came and filled in the hole. So then we built a picnic area on top of that and surrounded that whole park with um, native plants that crow that the people in the community um, valued, um, that they were sort of losing the ability to identify in the wild. And so most of them are wild plants um, that are planted in that space. And the kids did all the planning, which is awesome, because there's little signs there that the kids wrote themselves that say, you can pick the berries, please don't pick the plants. <laughs> it's so cute. Um, and, and they're little defenders of that space. And, and they have to be pretty vigilant, because um, there are morning glories that just <laughs> over the top of them all the time. So anyway, um, that is just sort of a, was a really small way of saying um, we want to build back in these values and, and that value of, of um, um, adults and children together in the planting and the harvesting of that space was really valuable. And so as soon as we put that in, you can see in Facebook the messages that people sent saying, you know, like, I thought I was never going to live in a place like this. And all we did was that little park in the corner. Um, thought I never was going to be able to see the place that I live in um, have these experiences again. And I didn't think that, um, you know, I would ever want to come back. And now there's a lot of people. We have 70 new students in the school district in one year because um, people are coming back because Lodgegrass is their home. And actually, more than 50% of the chiefs um, for the Crow Reservation, for the Crow Shire, have come from Lodgegrass. So it had a pretty major history that it's coming back from. If you talk to people now, right before we started our work anyway, uh, my father-in-law is a former chairman. Um, he just laughed. He said, you should just bulldoze that place and start over. Because people kind of thought of it as like the last worst place, you know, because it, it's rough. It's, it's a rough place because it's just been hard for a long, long time. Um, and uh, so anyway, we've done that. And then, you know, I don't mean also to say that food banks are bad in any way. But what I do mean to say is that you have to build social and spiritual context back into those things. Um, and so one of the ways we're trying to do it is, um, I also am the director for the Rural Health Opioid Project in Bighorn County, and so um, we're using funding um, to um, support parenting because more people are quitting their substance abuse on their own. Uh, and the number one reason to do that is parenting, and so we're really investing in Native parenting. So we have this Crock-Pot Club. Um, we give the families the Crock-Pot and a set of dishes to eat together. Um, and we are accessing Center Pool, which is um, kind of like um, fast, but yeah, um, and then we are also using Helping Hands in Hardin, um, and so we take the, it's women that are participating in the, um, the project, and it's monthly at the beginning of the month, right when SNAP benefits come out, so they go to Center Pole first, and then they go to Helping Hands, and then they shop for whatever's left, and we have a big list of all the groceries that are required to make dinner for 30 days, and um, so in our community, what this is ensuring is that everybody is having the foods that they want, and, the, um, and I'm saying that they want, even though it's also what we want, because they are the ones who said we want to eat differently. Um, so all those are built into those meals, and um, they. Um, oh, I lost my thought for a second there. Sorry. Um, oh, and then we also have men's um, hunting teams that are going out. They go with Center Pole to harvest bison. Um, one of the reasons we can't use the USDA processing centers because we can't use crow processing methods in according to their how they do it and, and we don't want to lose those and so we're trying really hard to do it in that way and so center full helps do that and so that gives dads access um, to their parenting role as leaders in the family and um, doing what they used to be able to do um, and to provide for those meals that the women are putting together it also allows kids <coughs> in our community to eat even if their parents are don't have the capacity to get up and turn on the crock pot so kids can 
you know, I have twin boys that are six. They can take the food out of the freezer, dump it in the crock pot, turn the crock pot on, and, and have food after school. Um, so that's another thing that we're kind of falling back on. Does the commercial kitchen have, like, a section where you can process Well, our commercial kitchen has nothing yet because we're still in the process of getting built. We just got the grant um, for it, and it's surprisingly slow because um, our USDA person has never built in his business incubator before, so it's a bit of a slow process, and we're, so we haven't actually broken ground yet to build that. But yes, we would like for it to have a place to process. And right now, Center Pole allows us to come in, like if they get a great big shipment of one kind of vegetable, and it's on our list of grocers <coughs> for those, um, 30 crock pot meals, we can come in, I can bring my own staff in and, and chop all of it and put it in the freezer, um, and then it's kind of just hanging out waiting for the following month. Um, and the reason we do it on the monthly cycle is with the SNAP benefits is because um, our one store, we don't want it to close, it's the only thing that's there. Um, but they were uh, frustrated because they felt like they were complicit in the drug trade that happens in our community because um, SNAP, they've removed the name off of the card so it only has a number. And I, and I totally get that that's for privacy of the individual, but that allows the cards to be traded and for the store not to be able to say that's not your card, you can't use it that way. And so um, that's the reason that we build it in right at the beginning of the month, is to get the money off the card for what it's intended for. Yeah? This is a question for all of you who work um, with the reservations. Uh, what are some other indigenous foods uh, that we're trying to put on the plate besides berries and wild meat? That's a really good question. And it's a question that we're working on right now. Um, across many different organizations and institutions, and MS, MSU is actually doing a lot of great work with us too, partnering with the Salish Kootenai College and also the Tribal Fisheries Program. Um, native fish were something that, it has been a food that has been eaten if, if people lived along the flathead, but unfortunately a lot of native fish are not around anymore. Um, so there's there are efforts to bring back at least the fish um, and also foods that grow along the riparian buffer. So um, a lot of these foods are still in existence and a lot of the elders that I work with, they still use them for teas and medicines and as greens as part of the meal. Um, something that you would cook with like a, a wild game. Um, up in up the mountains, like the Mission Mountains, there are a lot of wild roots and greens that also grow um, and, herb and herbs. And again, for medicines or food, and so I always look to these folks to kind of bring this to the forefront so that that knowledge can spread. But honestly, my biggest challenge right now is that a lot of these are family, family knowledge that doesn't really necessarily want to be shared. So the, the challenge I think for like the college wanting to introduce more traditional foods from our area or like Two Eagle in Pablo wants to have an entirely traditional food <coughs> menu we have a lot of family secrets. <laughs> and so what is gonna be on that menu? And so I've been talking to the chef and she is just, I don't know, we can't have elk every day. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so roots, flowers, greens, herbs, definitely all kinds of wild game and wild bird, like fowl um, <coughs> and fish uh, is definitely coming to the forefront and I think, it, I think it will become a, a place of understanding that nobody's trying to take any of your memories or, um, or things that you hold so dear to your family so that we can just share with the community at large. Uh, so that's my understanding at this point. Uh, I'd like to ask Danielle because yeah. Danielle <laughs> conducted a couple of camps this summer uh, around traditional foods and, and introducing traditional foods to uh, the camp. I just fish wire all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. <coughs> I think it's important that we look beyond our region. So yes, our region has buffalo and berries, but plus uh, like oh, 200 more plants. So it's not just using what we know or what's at the surface, but relearning those plants. There's so many roots that we have to re introduce back into our knowledge but not just our region, but recognizing that all indigenous food systems are not only sustainable, but a nutritious diet. Mm -hmm. So 
not being like, oh, we're only going to eat our region in as Blackfeet, oh, I'm only going to eat Great Plains traditional foods, but recognizing that blue corn and the three sisters method, all of these different foods are nutritious. All of these different foods were first foods to a nation. And I think it's, I think it's um, recognizing that. I really appreciate how um, Chef Sean Sherman and how Mariah Gladstone with Indigi Kitchen, they use all indigenous ingredients and they teach about how all of these indigenous ingredients came from right here in on this land. Um, so I think when we start to talk about incorporating indigenous foods, I think MSU does it well with their indigenous foods nights because they incorporate all foods. They take foods from different regions and put it into one plate and make that a meal. Um, I think it's important that we look beyond our region and don't stigmatize what indigenous foods are based on which land we're standing on, but realize across the nation and also into Mexico, into Canada, what foods were there and how the importance of peppers, the importance of wild rice, all of those are indigenous foods. So we have a wide variety and a very nutritious um, option when we go into indigenous foods. Can I add to that just real quick? Um, that's a lot more about having to do that nutrition as well. And so when we think about it from a policy perspective, and you know, we're also looking at the reserve rights of tribes, right? You know, so when you think about this area, you know, I mean, this was a part of the original Blackfeet Nation, the very first Blackfeet Reservation, right? To Camp Happy Yellowstone, Yellowstone River, to the Dakotas, right? And so if you look at the public services in those areas, we're also looking at um, uh, entering the MOUs with public lands managers. So we have uh, more of an influence on the management of those public lands. But more importantly, as you look at the, the Crow case, right, that went out with the Supreme Court that really upheld um, the right to hunt and gather and fish, right, on um, uh, the, uh, treaty rights, that upheld treaty rights. You know, we're looking at how we can utilize that as a foundation to really expand access to all of those other uh, species that we don't currently have available to us in our million and a half acres. So as you look at the ability to recognize the Black Bee hunting license, fishing license, gathering permit on public lands in our original Black Bee reservation after the land bill treaty, you know, that's two thirds of Montana. And so as we look at moving into those spaces, right, it's very important, you know, to, to think about access so as we think about uh, keeping foods, affo uh, uh, foods affordable, right? You know, but the other is that we're also, you know, in the middle of a beef bison processing plant, you know, that really looks at and explores putting that nutritious meat back into our local food delivery system, probably at cost, right? So as you look at, you know, the crop and you know, we want to sell out of the year, right? We want to sell to them, right? You know, but at the very end of the day, you know, um, uh, uh, people, especially SNAP, recipients need to have access to affordable food, right? You know, and, and so, because they can't afford that $18 lunch at, um, at the co-op, right? You know, so as we think about keeping foods affordable, we need to think about how we utilize policy to move into that space as well. I just wanted to touch, too, on the cultural camps. I just realized that's what you wanted me to talk about. Sorry. Um, we, did, we hosted some cultural camps. I was one of the um, head organizers on that. And at the cultural camps, um, we partnered, so I had this really great idea and this funding for um, a youth camp for traditional foods. I wanted to take them on the land, I wanted to show them plants that were used for medicines, I wanted to show them sustainable harvesting practices, not taking the whole root, um, and, and also feed them this nutritious traditional diet. But when it came down, oh, and I collaborated with another group that was, um, their camp was focused on substance abuse and um, historical trauma. We were perfect. Uh, I could do the foods there at the same time as we talked about with importance in the history of why we even need to reintroduce these foods into our, into our lives. Um, and when it came to making the menu, that was the hardest because I thought the same way. I was like, okay, we're gonna have buffalo every single day. Um, and, and then it was just like blank. And then so we were all sitting there, our team, trying to figure out what our menu was gonna be. And I was like, oh my gosh, you guys, let's just use all indigenous ingredients. And then, so then we started building our menus. And um, when it came to the camps, when we were serving, we serve our bundle holders first and our holy people and our elders, and then slowly get to the youth. Um, I kept having the question, where's the napayin? Where's the bread? And so we had to do a history lesson every single day at lunch. We had to talk about where's the bread and where did the bread come from. And then we, we incorporated, so I was like, okay, they need something with their stew. 
Um, so we did blue corn chips. And then we talked about the importance of blue corn to the southern tribes. We talked about the importance of nutrients in food, why it's blue and not yellow. Um, and this helped, it planted a seed in my community to, to start to think like that. We used the terms survival foods and traditional foods, and we tried to make those distinctions of what those are. Um, and we have three more years of camps to go, and I'm really excited to see where it goes. So we have time for one more question. Yeah, I know, time's flying, this is good. I was just gonna say with, along with these the thoughts about the food, because helping Native people to preserve their foods is important too. Like, we've been trying to grow Hidatsa corn um, on an all organic farm, um, just right outside of Crow, and the nearest other corn farm is a mile away, and it's still, we still are getting their GMOs and our genetic, and we cannot, we don't wanna use it, you know, in a, in a broad way without that. It's, it's really hard to preserve the, the food that we have traditionally with what we have around in, our, in the environment, so that's important. Uh, Megan, you, you spoke at one point about people not being offended. How, what, what, uh, you being offended or the people you're working oh, with? We just have an agreement among all of us. You know, when we're working, we're just going to try really hard not to get offended because it's hard work and, you know, people are passionate about what they do and it's really easy, you know, when you're, when you're working on these things, you know, because everybody's coming at it from their perspective. That's what I love about indigenous communities is that they're okay with that. You know, you can believe something completely different than me and, and we're going to be okay. Um, and so we're just learning to move through that. And it, it's just, you know, when you, when you do this kind of work, you need a lot of partners. And you're not gonna all ha share this exactly same stream of thought. But you have to find a way to move forward together. And at the bottom of it, it's gotta be on behalf of loving people that we do it. And so um, we call it being buttonless. You know, we just are, we sit through meetings and we don't let things push buttons. We think about them, we learn through them, you know, we process them, um, which is kind of, I guess it's the basic part of critical discourse, right, that we have in conversation. So that's what I really mean. If I can just add something to that. I'm Jill Falcon Mackin, and I'm a Turtle Mountain with Jill Black. I worked with the Blackfeet um, on the Native Land Project in the AMP. And uh, I study indigenous food systems and the changes to our indigenous food systems over time, 1780 to 1920s, and distribution work. One of the things I'd like to add as context to the discussion is that our food systems traditionally were highly complex with hunting and harvesting, wild harvesting and cultivation and trade being a really important part of things. And there's a lot of historical stereotypes about us being warring peoples amongst each other. And those are just false. Those are not what our ceremonies teach. They're not what our elders teach. They're not what the stories say. Um, I think that's a created idea of savage and uncivilized people. Um, we, we cooperated with each other traditionally. And uh, there's a reason why when Bruce and Clark pulled into the Nan Van Hidatsa Rikara homeland and needed supplies, that they were able to take on 2,500 pounds of corn there because they were in the market. They were trading amongst indigenous people. Um, and, and a highly sophisticated market of reciprocal trade. Um, so now we're in this time of how do we, as we've all been separated and put onto land that sometimes is not very conducive to um, harvesting um, and, and um, agriculture, um, how do we bring that element back in? How do we reconnect with trading partners? Um, so we're coming up with things like how do we bring agricultural, um, uh, indigenous agricultural products in the market with one another, in this different market that we're in, this capitalist market that we're in? And then how do we just reinvent our food system as 21st century, 21st century people, you know? So we're, we're rethinking everything, and culture and people and plants, everything is evolving, and at a very rapid rate because of climate change right now. So there's those challenges, but I think that the history of what we have um, and the way that we adapted and worked together is what we're trying to bring to the story right now. So, and I think Native identity is really wrapped up in that, what you were saying, and agreeing to get along. Backdrop is that we've been very divided against each other by this question of blood quantum, horrible bloody question, blood quantum, and how much, who's enough? 
is enough. And so being traditional or being not traditional, um, who's the right amount of Indian, who's enough Indian, those questions are a backdrop of the historical trauma of people. And so we're very carefully coming back into this and integrating our traditional ways as we pick up our bundles, pick up our knowledge, pick up our plant knowledge, and, and try to move into a healthier space um, following you know, a lot of division and a lot of colonization that's really divided us from each other and our, our traditions and our food systems. Thank you. Thank you. So we really probably do have time for one more question. Um, so does anyone have one more? Yes, yeah, I Amelia. I wanted to um, ask the entire panel, but I don't know if there's enough time. So hopefully the conversation continues. And I wanted to remind everyone to um, go back to those yellow poster boards in the ballroom um, and include your name and contact info if you want to be connected with someone, whether you see a missing link in your community or um, if you can provide something for a missing link, because we really want to the expo to be a place to connect people. But I wanted to ask the whole panel, um, what kind of partnerships uh, you'd like to see in the future? Because I know some of you mentioned a lot of really key um, partnerships within your community or across Montana. Um, and maybe so a, a look to the future, what kind of partnerships you'd like to make in the future? Should we start one at a time? Sure. Yeah, you can leave Yeah, at least here, speaking for Bozeman, I think um, having land partnerships so that beginning farmers can have a chance to experiment and fail um, without it completely ruining them is really important. Um, we have really fertile soil here. We have a, a good season and there are a lot of knowledgeable people in this community. Um, and I would love to see more partnerships that take the form of a mentor-mentee relationship um, with um, space and for people to mess up and experiment and find how they want to do what they're going to do and how it's going to be best for the community. Um, Farmhands has a lot of really incredible partners in our community as far as like the hospitals and all of the farmers and the markets and I think I think um, as far as doing what we do better, uh, the main place that we need more partners are with philanthropists and people within the community recognizing um, what we're working towards. We just recently had a, a dinner with a bunch of folks and we had um, the homeless student liaison for Columbia Falls and we had our practitioner for the food prescription program and and we we're talking about all these things and, and in an attempt to raise money and you know all of these people that live in our community don't know the extent to which we're dealing with homeless youth and, and homeless at homeless everyone and, and food insecurity and people you know, we service um, the canyon on the way to Glacier, those little towns up there, Martin City, Hungry Horse, Quorum, and those communities are very small and um, very few grocery stores, um, and the, the ability to actually get transportation there. And so I think, I think partnership um, with people that can be advocates for, um, for what we're, we're trying to accomplish. Um, we have, I mean, we really welcome partnerships across the board. That's the beauty of Farm to School. It really brings in a lot of stakeholders. But one area that I think we really need to work on are those agricultural producers, distributor um, connections and partnerships. And so I do welcome all of you and then anyone, you know, within that or other realms to join the working groups of the Farm to School leadership team. That's a new thing that we're trying to bring in that, those local voices across stakeholder groups. Um, and especially at our Montana Farm to School Summit coming up in September 2020 in Helena, that would be a great place to be able to connect those voices and really lift them up. My, my focus with the Fast Blackfeet it tends to be along the food distribution lines, is how will we get food 
to people and uh, and my way of thinking that's opening up the, the window of opportunity for then introducing foods that are truly healthy and truly cultural, uh, culturally relevant and the partnerships that we formed um, in uh, Browning and on the reservation with uh, the uh, Indian Health Service, uh, as I mentioned, the ARMP, the Browning Public Schools, um, and their feeding programs. Those are all very important, but I, to, I think what uh, Brenna was alluding to is I would like uh, more of a opportunity to sit down with donors and people, or as Michael McCormick back there likes to say, investors in your in your community to explain the importance of uh, funding these programs and being able to uh, actually make them uh, not a giveaway program, but a way to regenerate and build economic opportunity within our region. So I don't know what that may be, a, a round table of, I you know Hopa Mountain does, brings together some uh, uh, donors and philanthropists to talk about these things, but maybe opportunities like that would be really helpful. Okay. I think there's two things that um, would be helpful. Um, Number one is that um, you know when funding is available, or for if philanthropists want to participate, I think um, structures that allow Native people to determine how they're going to set up what they would like to be funded are important because right now we have to bend a lot of what our community would like to do to fit, you know, government models for um, or you know philanthropy has ideas about how they want things to be used and really allowing Native people to to be in the driver's seat of that is I think important in, behind funding. The um, second thing that I think is important is um, access to internships for our Native students and, and people growing into these positions because, you know, like like the map you saw with 98% of people in agriculture being white, um, if Native people have access to that knowledge that, you know, sort of becomes privileged knowledge over time, um, then they're able to do that leadership in their own company, in their own communities, you know, and. Um, in a lot of war-torn countries, they'll use a model that's called the link model. While cultures are trying to rebuild themselves, someone with knowledge will come in with the intention that they're not going to stay, that they'll leave as soon as they can raise someone up in the community that can do that job. And um, I just think that there are a lot of really skilled, really powerful Native people, Native students, um, that have dreams of being able to do stuff, and they just need a door open for them. And, and as non-Native people, we have, we're able to do that. We're able to hold the door open. Um, and we need to do that more. Um, and if anybody knows uh, Michael Smith from that movie, The Need to Grow, I really have a student that I want him to, to mentor him. So if you know him, help me contact him. I messaged him on Facebook and he didn't call me back. <laughs> I have six days before I can write this nomination for $3,000 for this student. So if you know him, <laughs> hook me up. <laughs> Um, just to like kind of tag onto Scott and, and Megan, there are a lot of projects happening in my area, whether they're, well most of the time they're not tribal health department, um, unless it's something, something related to substance abuse. Um, but the community has a lot of things going on that are grant funded and it's not necessarily sustainable. So we have great projects happening all the time centered around health and food, and then they have to kind of switch gears to satisfy a different grant. Um, so I really would love to partner with some strategy thinkers on how to, to kind of take that system that we have right now and make it more sustainable. I know with the T-HIP program, we have consistent funding from the state. It is not grant funded. So how can we use our programmatic monies to help these local these local organizations really make it work, um, I want to partner with people like Lauren and Will and and remind me of your name. Is it Amelia? Danielle. It is Danielle. Okay, um, because Browning's got a lot of cool things going on. Like you guys are killing it. So in terms of policy, like we really need to work on policy uh, for CSKT for Salish Kootenai because there is a lot of energy without direction and structure. So I'd like to see that happen. Um, our schools work with 
organizations like Food Corps, but that ends and the students leave. You know, how can I work with Montana Farm to School more often so that all of the elementary schools have access to this fresh fruit and vegetables and all, all the Head Starts can do Harvest of the Month and our teenagers in the high schools, they, they want to work in the food system along the line somewhere as a farmer or as a producer, as a, somebody who is working in kitchens or starting their own food-based businesses. I want to understand who these people are that can just kind of help me open doors and um, just kind of help these teens and <coughs> people that have a lot of potential that are just wondering what to do or they're going to move away. So let's keep our communities resilient. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, there's a lot of work to be done. Well, I want to thank the panel um, and the audience for the fantastic questions and conversation. Now it's lunchtime. Uh, then we will get back together for our 1.30 sessions. Um, so enjoy lunch and thank you again for being here.